Hey guys, welcome back to the social media forum. Hope you've uh, gotten a little bit out of the sessions we've had so far. And we're going to kick off to our next presenter, who's virtual for our studio, studio audience, uh, Miss Laura Reichlich. She's a uh, social media strategist with Hootsuite. Awesome. Thank you so much. I'm very excited to be joining you all today. I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen, get that deck loaded up. There we go. So hopefully you should see that now. Um, but I hope everyone's having a good day so far, had a good lunch. Um, I got to tune into a few sessions this morning and there was a lot of great info. So ready to continue on this afternoon. So my name is Laura. Um, I'm a social media strategist here at Hootsuite um, based just outside of Toronto, Canada. So Thank you so much for having me today. I'm very excited to be chatting with all of you. So in terms of today's agenda, what we're really gonna dive into, we've got a few different uh, topics here. So first we'll start off with a social networks crash course where we'll really understand the different nuances between the different networks. And then we'll dive into content planning where we'll chat a little bit about you know, how you can jumpstart some of those pieces of content that you might be creating ahead of time just so that you know what you wanna post. And then we'll also chat through some best practices for social content. So we'll dive into a few different um, examples to get some inspiration, but we'll also have a fun activity planned together for those of you that are, you know, um, with us both, you know, virtually, but also in person. And then finally, we'll also dive into volume and cadence. So thinking about how we can make sure we're reaching our audience um, at the right time. There we go. Now, of course, we'll also leave plenty of room at the end for any questions that you might have. So feel free to get those questions ready and we'll leave plenty of room at the end for um, diving into some of those as well. Awesome. So with that, let's start off with a social networks crash course. So I always think a really great place to start is chatting about why social media is important and what it can mean to really have a great social presence. And as you start building out what that social presence is for your brand, it should ultimately help you first, you know, draw people in, um, maybe by sharing some interesting content, whether it's thought-provoking or helpful or even humorous, right? Folks need a good laugh or smile from time to time too in that social media content. Um, it should also help you drive some valuable conversations. So asking questions to your audience to drive engagement, really, you know, encouraging people to start a conversation. Or alternatively, you also see a lot of times now, you know, brands using their profiles to jump in on existing conversations that are happening online as well. So that's another really good way to get a little extra, um, you know, reach or brand awareness for your channels by jumping in on some of those existing conversations that are already happening. Now, next, your social presence should also provide essential information about your specific organization. So, you know, thinking about the location, what you do, and then ultimately, you know, what value you can also provide to others. And then last but not least, um, you know, a great social presence should also open you up to relationship and community building. So that's a really big piece for especially brands on social media is being able to build sort of that community around you know, your particular industry so that folks can go there to get really great resources, chat with others that are a part of the community um, and really ultimately build some relationships there. So I've got um, one poll here that would love your input on. So if you're joining us in person, feel free to break out your phone or if you're joining us virtually, open up your phone or a separate desktop window, whatever you're joining from, and head on over to slido.com. And there you'll find a participant code, which is 
four. Alternatively, two, um, if in person, it might be a little small, but if you're joining virtually, there is a QR code there. So you can open up your camera on your smartphone and scan that QR code and it will take you right to the activity too. But would love to see where your brands are active on social media. So what networks are you currently using today? So it's looking like a lot of Facebook so far. Twitter is creeping up there too. Awesome. So we'll give it a minute or so for folks to, to join in and vote on this poll here. Amazing. So still mostly Facebook, a little bit on TikTok too, which is very cool to see. Instagram is coming up too. Amazing. So it's really great to see just off the bat um, for those of you that are voting that, you know, you're leveraging pretty well all of the social networks here, which is really, really fantastic to see. All right, we'll give it 10 more seconds. And for those of you that have already voted, feel free to leave that window open just because we're going to be using Slido again later on for our activity together. Beautiful. Okay, so it's looking like majority Facebook, Instagram, um, but really Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn are kind of hovering around the same amount there, but definitely lots of Facebook. So that's amazing to see. Thank you so much for voting. Feel free to keep voting if you like, um, and then also just keep that window open for the activity later. Perfect. So let's take a look then at the different social channels that are usually leveraged by, you know, different brands and organizations and work through some of the nuances that differentiate them. So when looking at this chart, um, you know, I would say the far left hand side is the most professional. And then as you work your way to the right hand side, they definitely start to become more personal. So we'll go through each of these. Um, now, typically when looking at something like LinkedIn, a really great way to think about it is almost like a professional trade show. So it's really a fantastic spot to, you know, post some thought leadership or industry trends, um, build out, you know, a recruitment presence as well by sharing some people focused stories or brand award related stories. And then of course, you know, what it's most well known for, I would say, which is that professional networking piece. So maybe having folks that are a part of, you know, your organization post about their experience and that can always help with, you know, that professional networking piece and building out that uh, content awareness. Now, as we move over to Twitter, you can almost think of this like a cocktail party. Now, for those of you that might go to a cocktail party from time to time, you can think about when you go to one, typically, you know, you're sharing the high level of what's new with you today at those cocktail parties. So it's all very sort of high level what's happening right now. So you can kind of think of Twitter in the same way. It's a really great place to kind of get a pulse on the conversation or share industry news. Um, anything that's you know trending or timely are all really good to see on Twitter there. Now, because it's very much a what's happening right now platform, um, you definitely wanna keep posts short and sweet there, but also very timely to what's happening in sort of your industry there. Now, as we move over to Facebook, which a lot of you are leveraging, which is fantastic to see, a great way you can kind of think of that is almost like a dinner party. So the way that that differentiates, we're thinking, you know, the cocktail party is high level news, what's happening right now. The dinner party is where we get into more of those stories. So, you know, we're sharing more um, of that information or brand related stories in a more casual way. Um, but, you know, also playing into more of that, um, you know, story piece, giving a more well-rounded view there. And, you know, I would say as well, Facebook is a very visual first platform as well. So definitely thinking about the different images or videos that you might use to really tell your story and engage others in that story. Now, when we move over to something like Instagram, um, it's one of the more personal platforms that in TikTok. 
So you can kind of think of it almost like a digital art gallery. So it's a very, very visual first platform. You want to be thinking about, you know, the different images and the videos that you might use to really tell a story or grab someone's attention. And so you can kind of think about it like if you're going to an art gallery, walking around, taking a look at some of the pieces that are there, typically the art itself will grab your attention first, right? And then you'll stop and maybe read a little bit more about the artist and the inspiration behind the piece or whatnot. So you can kind of think of Instagram in the same way. That video or that image is going to grab their attention and then they'll read the rest of your post. And then finally, we have TikTok. So a few of you are on that, which is really cool to see. And the big thing to think about with TikTok is being authentic. So you can kind of think of it like a FaceTime or a Skype call that you might have with a friend or a family member where, you know, a lot of that authenticity of who you are really shines through in that FaceTime call. Um, so you can think of TikTok in the same way, like chatting with a friend or chatting with a family member. Um, usually content that maybe has a host to put a little personal face to sort of the brand can be really helpful. Um, but you want to stray away from the overly perfect video on TikTok. So nothing too produced. Um, you really want to maintain that authenticity over perfection there. All right. Now, one thing to keep in mind as well is that with social platforms, it can be really, really easy to get into the habit of cross posting the same message across you know, multiple social media platforms, especially if you're tight for time, maybe you're a small team and just trying to stretch that content a little bit further. I think we've all been there for sure. Um, and it's important to just remember back to, you know, those nuances that we were just chatting about for each platform and really trying your best to tailor that content a little bit if you can to, you know, those different nuances. So maybe if you have a post um, about, you know, recruitment, for example, you might want to tweak it based on the network that it's going on. Perfect. And then I also wanted to share this great quote from Gary V, Gary Vaynerchuk, which says, if you're telling a story from a park bench to three old guys playing chess, you're going to present it differently than you would sharing that same story in an auditorium at Radio City Music Hall. It all depends on the room you're in and the context with which it lives. And this is a really interesting thought because it helps you sort of remember that we really need to be considering our audience at all times. So one example that we can think of is even from more traditional media. Um, so, you know, before social media, things like newspaper, television, books. Um, and as you know, stories are all told a little bit differently based on the audience or the medium there. So kind of like how books and movies are generally fairly similar, you know, they might have the same plot if an author writes a book and then it gets turned into a movie later on. But there always will be slight differences in that storyline. And that's typically because, you know, they're playing to the movie audience rather than necessarily the book audience. So really, we need to kind of think about social media in the same way, right? Um, you know, each platform is different and therefore also needs to be addressed differently. Beautiful. Okay, so we'll dive into chatting a bit about content planning now. So when thinking about building out, you know, all of this great content that you're going to share um, and planning ahead, I always find it really helpful to have sort of a master overview of different dates, events, or milestones, just so you can plan any content for those ahead of time and not feel super rushed. And it can also give you a really good opportunity to have more time and space to jump on some of those more trending pieces because you've got all of this content already sort of blocked off and ready to go. So different things that you could consider could be different local or community events or initiatives, topical things. So perhaps some campaign launches or different resources and tips and tricks your audience might find helpful. 
Or you could also dive into relevant things as well, such as some industry trends um, or, you know, holidays that sort of map back to your industry as well there. So I always find it helpful putting it in a bit of a calendar format. Some of you may already have something like this in place, which is fantastic. If not, this could be a really good starting point where you start to map out some of those holidays, days, campaigns you might have coming down the pipeline ahead of time and break it down into months just so that it's all really visible and something that you can reference later. So here, let's say, you know, we're in September. Maybe I want to be starting to plan my October content already. Um, I definitely would want to be. So maybe I want to create um, a really cool image for Navy Day or Women in Military Service for America Memorial Anniversary. Maybe I want to plan a really cool video for that. So having that ahead of time and knowing what's coming down the pipeline can help with that content creation piece and know you know what you might want to create so you're not feeling super rushed. All right, now once you have all of that content planned out and you know you start posting it, you'll also want to take a look over time for any patterns. So is there you know a particular topic or image or video format that you're using that typically drives the response you're hoping to get? whether that be maybe driving some likes, maybe getting conversations going in the comments or you know, having someone reach out as well to your organization. So thinking about what response you want to achieve from your social posts and thinking about what's really getting that response for me already. You also wanna take a look at what has the highest engagement for you. So are there any patterns or similarities there between some of those posts that drive some of the highest engagements for you? Could also be a really good indicator into what your audience likes to see. Um, next, you wanna think about are people responding in the same way across all of your social networks? Or do you typically, you know, get more engagement on one platform than another. So maybe you get more engagement on Facebook than perhaps Twitter. So it's interesting to just kind of look at that, right? What's driving the most um, you know, response and engagement for you in terms of conversations. And then finally here, do people engage when you ask a question, whether that be you know, in something like a poll or you know, in a question in the post itself? Now, I'd say too, um, a lot of the times, and I believe there was a question this morning too, where it's like, you know, I'm posting, but no one's engaging with me or maybe answering the questions that I get um, or that I'm asking on my sort of profile there. So I would say one tip to think about is just to look at your post and see if the content itself in the question you're asking is too niche. Um, you know, sometimes, you don't know necessarily, well, you should do a little research to who's following you, but it's always good to keep an eye on, you know, is this question accessible to anyone to answer perhaps? Um, because if it's too niche, then you might not get all of the engagement or responses that you're wanting to get. So definitely take a look um, and sort of check that out, but that's always a, a good indicator there, you know, is the question too niche? Can I broaden this and make it more accessible for others? All right, now along that same line, you'll also want to consider your audience on each network. So, um, you know, who is following you, taking a look at that demographic information on each network, but also how that audience might be spending their time on that network as well. So if you're, you know, looking at your yearly sort of content overview, the calendar that we had just looked at, and you're saying, you know, I really want to post in December about the end of the year or, you know, the holiday season. You could say, well, you know, most of the people um, that are typically following me on LinkedIn also are kind of going there for industry news or maybe looking at jobs and employment ideas. So maybe what I'll do on LinkedIn is I'll share a cool blog highlighting some stats from 2022 to kind of wrap up the year, maybe about the industry, maybe about, you know, the number of recruits we got this year. So just playing into more of that industry piece and sharing some really interesting stats on LinkedIn. 
And then maybe for Facebook and Instagram, I want to share um, something that's more of a story. So maybe I want to film a video highlighting members of the organization, um, maybe sharing some interesting sort of stats or things that they learned this year, or you know, even their highlight of 2022, something that was um, really cool that happened. And that sort of plays into more of the storytelling piece of the platform, but it also plays into the fact that typically, you know, if someone's heading over to something like Facebook or Instagram, they're going there to interact with different friends or family members that they might follow. So people might, you know, prefer to interact with more of that human element, um, whether it's being, you know, seeing coworkers or themselves or family members or friends that are highlighted in that video. So just thinking about the different networks, but also, you know, what those folks are doing when they go to that network. Awesome. Okay. So with that, we'll dive into some best practices for social content. Um, so we'll go through lots of examples together, but then we'll also have the activity at the end of this sort of section here. So with that being said, um, you know, let's start off with thinking about the four different things that social media content should do. And really it can be broken down into four buckets, which are to educate, entertain, inspire, and convert. So we'll go through each of these in a little more detail, chat through some examples as well. Um, but for educate, first up here, really, you know, this content is meant to spark curiosity and to someone's knowledge bank. Um, so sometimes on social, this can be seen as answering frequently asked questions or sharing did you know statements or tips and tricks. So I thought this example here from the US Army was a really cool example of an educate post. Um, you know, it has this really authentic sort of video format where someone is chatting with the audience in sort of that host kind of format. But they're providing a lot of really great tips and tricks and the audience is called out directly in the caption too, right? They're addressing new recruits who may be still, you know, looking online for resources as they get started in the army, trying to learn some tips and tricks. Perhaps too, this could be really interesting for someone who's considering becoming a new recruit as well and just starting that research phase. So sharing some of this information can be really helpful to, to educate some of those folks that might still be looking for, you know, some tips and tricks and, and resources there. All right. And then next up, we have content that entertains and this is always a really great format since it allows you to get creative and develop something that's, you know, really captivating and fun um, and keeps your audience engaged and wants to know what's coming next. So you could consider sharing some unique stories, perhaps about, you know, the organization itself or also some great behind the scenes content as well. Maybe showing, you know, day in the life, lots of different options with that behind the scenes piece there. So I thought this was a really great example of an entertain post from the US Air Force recruiting um, Instagram page. And so what they've essentially done is they've created a short video that has a lot of different behind the scenes clips in a video celebrating the US Air Force turning 75 this month. Um, I will say like it was so captivating to watch all of the clips were very short and sweet. So it keeps someone's attention because the image is constantly changing as well. Um, but you know, it's uh, a very sort of excitable piece, you know, watching that myself, I was like, wow, this is so cool. Can't wait to see more content around that 75th sort of anniversary there. So that's always a great example of an entertain post showing lots of behind the scenes content for a nice celebration. All right, now on to inspire. Now with this type of content in particular, you just of course wanna make sure you're remaining careful um, as you wanna make sure you know, you're being very genuine and authentic in your approach. So some examples of inspirational content that you could share with your audience could be different community involvement stories or people focused stories. Um, 
ideally you just want to sort of inspire positive or memorable moments that stay with your audience and drive them to take maybe a certain action. So this post from the US Navy, I thought was a really fantastic example of an inspire post. Um, they're really highlighting a people focused story of Lieutenant Allison Hands. She's carrying, um, you know, her grandmother's legacy of being in the US Navy, which is a phenomenal story. And they kind of go into that in the caption there. Um, but I love, love, love that at the end of the post, they also encourage others to share their own photos too, right? Using um, the hashtag US Navy um, or you know, tagging them as well to be featured. So it's a great way to get some of that um, you know, user-generated content as well to share. All right, and then last but not least, we have content that aims to convert. Now, when we say convert, it doesn't necessarily have to mean, you know, buy X product or service now. I think a lot of people typically think of something like that, but rather it's building out promotional content that encourages your audience to take some kind of next step from your particular call to action. So this post from the US Marine Corps, I thought was a fantastic example as well of some convert content. Um, even just looking through their page, they do a really, really good job at that convert content. So I'd encourage you to take a look. Um, but this post in particular was a gallery that had a bunch of different images that you could swipe through to see you know, some of the different um, physical sort of challenges there for the Marine Corps. But the thing I'll mention as well, a little tip, is if you're posting a gallery on Instagram, um, it's really quite cool because if someone's following your account and your post comes up on their newsfeed and they don't really engage with that first image in your gallery, when they close it out and reopen Instagram at a later time, there's a high chance they'll be reserved a different image in that gallery. So it can be a really cool option to sort of re-engage someone, hopefully get the engagement the second time around. Um, so that could be one cool little tip to, to give a try there. But this post in particular, you know, it links out to an article to read more about, you know, Marine Corps physical fitness. But they also do a really great job with, you know, other come join us type call to actions as well in their posts. So um, great example there of a convert post. All right. Now, when thinking about visuals on any kind of post that you're sharing on social media, really, I would say, you know, visuals are vital to stand out and stop the scroll. And what I mean by that is a lot of the times people are scrolling through social media when A, they either want to research or look something up, so get some more information on something, or they're also going to be scrolling through when they have a free minute, maybe they're a little bored, want to pass some time. So, you know, you really want to make sure the imagery that you're using or the videos are thumb stopping. So you want to essentially get them to stop scrolling through uh, because your image has stood out to them as something really cool. And then they'll go through and read the caption and follow your particular call to action there. So when thinking about how we can sort of up our posts, get them more creative, um, a few different ideas here that could be interesting to try. First one is a visual list. Second is infographic. And then the last one here is interactive. So we'll go through each of these with a few examples as well. So for a visual list, this is essentially where you get some great information and you highlight it in sort of a list format. Maybe you use some emojis as those bullet points to add in a little bit of that visual interest. Um, I will say too, everyone loves a good list, right? They're very easy to read, um, you know, get some good information from. So even thinking about, you know, that Marine Corps example, talking about the different fitness sort of challenges they go through, perhaps, you know, it's linking out to a blog post, maybe you highlight a few of those really interesting sort of key summary pieces in a visual list as well. Um, so that could be something really interesting to think about if you've got a blog or resource, maybe you highlight those key takeaways with some bullet points there. Next up, we have an infographic. So infographics are 
so phenomenal for social media. They're really, you know, mapped out in a very visual first way. There's usually lots of great data points on there, um, some visual interest as well. So these, I would say, are really highly shareable, but also savable. And when, you know, you have something like this, it also gives the user who's interacting with that, if they share it out, they look like a really cool industry expert as well because they're sharing all this great data. So I remember earlier this morning, someone had a question, you know, about being in more of a research field and not being able to capture as much maybe live photography in a field like that. Well, this could be a really good option to try, right? Sharing some cool infographics, have them designed in a really interesting way. Um, if you're creating, you know, or if you have created a really big infographic as well, you could also consider breaking it down into micro content where you'll take little snippets of that infographic and post them separately. And that just helps stretch your content a little bit further as well. All right, and then finally we have interactive. And so this could either be posting a question in the caption itself, kind of like what we have here, or it could also be leveraging a poll. Um, and so this is really just trying to generate some good conversation with your audience, maybe get to know them a little bit better. Um, so that could be a good option to get some sort of engagements going there as well. Now, as I mentioned earlier, you wanna make sure you're leaving out too much jargon, making sure it's accessible to everyone, but also, I would say, don't be afraid to leverage your own network. So a lot of the times I feel like people get intimidated. They don't want to be the first one to comment or the first one to vote. They want to sort of wait and see what someone else does and then participate. Um, so maybe, you know, you ping a coworker that you have or let family and friends know or even yourself and go in there and vote or answer the question first and then as people see you know there's more engagement on that question or poll they'll be inclined to go in there too because sometimes people are just afraid to be the first one beautiful okay so we have our fun activity um so feel free to bring out to that slido sort of um uh window again but what I would love for you to do is open up your phone or a desktop window and go to any social media network of your choice. So LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, whatever it is for you. And I want you to type in the hashtag, hashtag armed forces. And once you've done that, I want you to look for a post that really stood out to you. It could have stood out to you because it's phenomenal. It's maybe a really cool educate post or entertain post. Maybe it stood out for you because it's a really horrible post, you know, lots of different options. Um, so I'd love for you to find one that made your thumb stop scrolling and just write in Slido what about the post made it stand out for you. So we'll give it a minute or so. Well, we'll give it a few minutes um, for you to find your post and then just write about what stood out to you in that post there.
All right, we'll give it another minute or so. Some great answers coming in so far. Amazing. So I'm seeing so far lots of people posting about, you know, the image itself being really captivating, which is amazing. Um, someone mentioned good quality images, beautiful authenticity, right? And so it's a very authentic image, maybe not um, super highly edited either. I saw one that made me laugh too, where it said um, that there was a, a dog in it. That is a thumb stopping image for those of us that love dogs. It's beautiful. Yeah, so this one here, when it's authentic and doesn't rely on heavy production or editing, right? So the image itself maybe is very captivating, tells a story right there in the image itself. Let's see what else we got. This one seemed irrelevant. Yeah, so it stood out because maybe it wasn't about the topic or had nothing to do with the topic. So it really stood out, maybe not for a positive reason, right? Beautiful, some good history related ones around 9-11, definitely captivating. Yeah, so this one, inappropriate post um beautiful relatable content hashtags amazing oh this is really interesting thought too so what stood out the most as i scrolled through the tag is that not many posts made me want to stop and engage a lot of the posts i'm seeing aren't u.s forms uh, armed forces the one that made me stop the longest was a school celebrating Armed Forces Day in Pakistan and was of children wearing uniforms to school. So that's interesting to think about too, right? Especially if you're wanting to leverage certain hashtags, is going and making sure that that hashtag is maybe relevant, right? Beautiful. Awesome. So lots of really, really good answers there. Thank you so much for sharing. So what I would encourage you to do when thinking about even an activity like this is that it can be really, really helpful to check in on, you know, some hashtags related to your industry, but also just scrolling through your own personal news feeds as well and finding some of these thumb stopping posts that stand out to you, maybe perhaps more for good reasons. Um, and saving some of those in sort of a doc or a note on your phone. And you can always reference those later for inspiration, right? So of course you wanna leverage those industry related ones, but even perhaps if you're scrolling through your own personal network and you find a really cool image template or video um, sort of idea, you can always take that as inspiration and sort of tweak it, make it your own and share that as well from a brand perspective. So I would encourage you to, you know, think of stuff like this, keep those in an inspiration doc somewhere that you can then leverage for your own social media. Beautiful. Okay, so we'll wrap it up here with talking about volume and cadence, and then we'll open it up for any questions that you might have. So when thinking about how often you should post, a general rule of thumb is typically one to two times per day on Facebook, one time per day on Instagram. Mind you, that's just feed posts. You can always post a lot more stories, one to two times per day on LinkedIn and up to five times per day on Twitter. But really, I would say, you know, it comes down to being consistent rather than worrying about the number of times that you post. So, you know, start small, choose a cadence that you can commit to regularly, whether that's a few times a week. And then you can always increase that if you choose to do so once you get comfortable with the routine that you have for yourself. 
Now, really the main thing it comes down to is having that consistent pipeline of content since you don't want your channels to go silent, but you also don't want to be posting a ton of content either and giving your audience content fatigue. I believe one of the speakers talked about that this morning too, right? If you're scrolling through and you see so many posts from the same brand, you might mute them or unfollow them. Um, so, you know, you definitely want to have a regular posting schedule, but not overload. Um, and that will really help play into not only the follower growth piece, but also driving more engagements on your content as well. So to really showcase what I mean by consistency is key, I've got an example here to show you. Um, and these calendars both actually have the exact same number of posts, but as you can see, the one on the left-hand side has them spread out every other day, which is really fantastic for the algorithm, optimizing their content, just because it's very predictable, right? And then the example on the right-hand side has them going out every day for a week and then off for a week, and it's just a little more sporadic. Um, so if you're creating content on the fly, it might be a little bit harder to consistently hit that example on the left, but you know, by building out that content calendar and getting ahead of some of the content that you wanna share, it will be easier to sort of continue building into that consistency piece there. Amazing. So now that we know how often we should post, another sort of question we see a lot is things like when we should post. And, you know, the first thing to keep in mind is that social media feeds are, of course, no longer displayed in real time. So as you all know, you know, there's these algorithms that show your audience content that's more relevance based towards their personal interests. And so really social networks prefer highlighting content that's got some high engagements on it. So with that being said, you know, your goal in order to get your content showing up on people's feeds in this algorithm is to really encourage your audience to, you know, engage with your content by liking, commenting, sharing it, um, all of that good stuff. So how can you do that? Right, it's easier said than done. Um, so one good way to think about is just posting when your audience is online. So you'll wanna take a look at your analytics. So dive into those demographics and really understand who your audience is and focus your posting schedule around that. So some social networks like Instagram, if you've got like the business page, will show you, you know, when your audience is online there. Um, but otherwise, I would say take a look at those demographics, see where your audience is based, and then a good sort of rule of thumb you could think about is posting in the morning and then around lunchtime and then in the evening for that sort of time zone that that audience is in. All right, so we've covered a lot of ground today and want to make sure there's plenty of time for any questions. So I've got just a few key takeaways here and then we'll open it up for any questions that you have. So the first one is considering the nuances and strengths of each platform when creating all of that great content that you're creating. So thinking about, you know, the LinkedIn industry trade show, Twitter cocktail party, Facebook dinner party, and Instagram digital gallery. The second one there is ensuring social content has a purpose and maps back to one of the four outcomes. So, you know, whether your content is educating folks or entertaining, inspiring, or you know, aiming to convert. And then last but not least, experiment with different content formats and ideas to see what works best for you. So maybe you wanna give a try um, you know, an infographic or a poll or question or leveraging a visual list with some cool key takeaways there. Um, you know, really just don't be afraid to try something new. Take a look at your sort of doc that you have with different content ideas that you like, that you might wanna try. And as you're trying some of these new ideas, um, keep tabs on your analytics, you know, see how they perform for you. Do they draw the reaction you're wanting to from your, from your audience there? Um, and then of course, you know, just try that, uh, that content inspiration doc to find ideas that could be interesting to give a go, whether it's related to your industry or not. All right, and with that, that is everything on my end. So I'll open it up for anyone that has any questions.
Guys, do we have any questions in the audience? If so, just approach one of the question mics and she can hear you. But you can't just ask it out because she won't be able to hear you. Anything? No? Yes? Oh, we got one coming. Just a second. Hold on. My bad. Hi, um, I have a question. So um, how do you gain attention uh, across language and geographic barriers when you're posting in one time zone, but also trying to get attention in a different time zone and a completely different language? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I would say, um, you know, taking a look at those demographics, um, if you know, you've got two different sort of zones. Um, maybe it's posting the different language post in more of the time zone related for that sort of geographic area. So I would say even if it's the same post, but you're sharing it in different languages, if it's meant for different geographic regions, don't be afraid to, to share those differently. Um, I also know as well, on platforms like LinkedIn, you can also do um, dark posts where, you know, there's not necessarily paid associated with it, but you can do organic targeting. So you could always think about doing something like that for different geographic regions as well. Great. Any other questions? Yes, got one over there. Uh, so I just wanted to see if you could dive a little bit more into the interactive uh, portion of that that three part that you went into, um, and specifically about how to formulate some of those questions to engage the audience. We can't run polls. We can't do the other item that you had up there. So it was only the questions that you had, only the questions mm -hmm. portion. So. Um, are there other options out there or just how do we maximize the ability of, of questions on the platforms? Yeah, that's a great question. So for something like, um, let's say LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, I would say don't be afraid to just write out a really engaging question, um, but something that's accessible too, right? So making sure the language itself isn't too heavy in jargon, um, but something that's open-ended that anyone could answer there. And then in order to jumpstart some of the engagements, because as I was mentioning, some people are a little bit nervous to be the first one to answer a question. Um, you could always dive in on your personal profile or get some you know, other colleagues or um, you know, friends and family to jump in and answer that question too, to start getting some of that engagement going. And then you might see some of your audience participating as well. Um, and then with something like Instagram, there's always the option of using different polls and quizzes and whatnot in the stories. I'm not sure if you're able to, to leverage those, but that can be a really great way to get some engagement going as well. Any other questions, guys? Questions, comments, concerns? Let me check my... Oh, is there? Oh, there's an app on. Oh, there's questions on the app you're getting, Laura. Perfect. All right. I see um, a few questions coming in on Slido. Someone's saying, What questions do you have regarding hashtags? Um, so for hashtags, I would say, you know, you want to, especially for something like Instagram anyways, when you're leveraging hashtags, you kind of want a mix of high, medium and low competition hashtags. So an example of a high sort of competition um, hashtag could be, um, you know, hashtag love, for example, if you're thinking of something for Valentine's Day, there's probably going to be a ton and ton and ton of posts there. And you might not rank on something like that. Whereas a more niche hashtag, you know, um, will have less posts on it. So you have a higher probability of ranking there. So you kind of want a mix of all three when you're thinking about Instagram. On the other networks, I would say it's using one to three hashtags max in your post and either putting them at the end or spreading them out throughout the post copy itself, just because you don't want any 
back to back in the actual post itself because from a readability standpoint, it makes it really hard for folks to read. Um, so I would say that's kind of a, a good rule of thumb when it comes to hashtags, but definitely, you know, search up different industry terms and that can be a really good option to find some of those hashtags as well that you might want to use. Um, I see another question. Our goal is to reach people in the 18 to 24 age group. How would you suggest reaching that audience group on Facebook and Instagram since TikTok isn't an option for us? So I would say um, if you have the ability to leverage paid, that can always be a great option because you can target that audience specifically. If not, I would say, um, you know, leveraging your community. So people that are in that age group that are maybe, maybe already a part of your organization, have them act as, you know, internal influencers for you, sharing about their experience, talking about, you know, um, what they do on a day to day. If they're comfortable as well, you know, you could always reshare some of that content or have them create content for your brand channels. Um, so that can be a really great way to sort of um, reach that group in a very authentic way. But otherwise, I would just say um, when thinking about like educational resources or inspiration or, or whatnot, think about what that group might be looking for. Um, so thinking back to the example we went through in the educate post where it was targeted towards new recruits, um, you know, you had a host giving tips and tricks about some of those, um, you know, pieces that they might need to know. And it calls it right out in the caption itself. So that could be another interesting thing to think about there. Just making sure, you know, you're addressing or creating content for that particular audience. All right. Um, Or I, got did, a, I did see yeah. a few more on your, your app. I don't think we have anything else in studio. If you want to answer one of these on the, on the app. Mm -hmm. we'll do it. Right. Anything else, guys? Anything? No? Awesome. Well, Laura, thank you for your time. I appreciate you tuning in uh, to the show. Uh, really some valuable information. And, and again, just appreciate everything that you're doing. Thanks so much for having me. No problem. All right, guys, for those in the, uh, the studio, we're going to go on a short break. And when we come back, we'll have a sit down and discuss policy and procedure.